Hi everyone, I'm Joanna. I'm the CEO of Benevolent. I'm really excited to be with you here today. I've got three of my colleagues that came in from London along with me. And um, we're excited today because we're going to take you on a journey into a, um, a new revolution in drug discovery and development. So together with the three of them, there's Ali, Pajita, and um, Jamie, we're going to show you something we haven't shown before, and that is how our AI platform works in the development and treatment of new dise of diseases and by developing new medicines to treat them. I'm sure you guys have been hearing here at South by Southwest a lot about moonshots. You know, moonshots are this, this great initiative where you apply technology for the benefit of humanity. Well, at Benevolent, our moonshot is tackling challenging diseases that have no cure. We believe at Benevolent that unconventional thinking combined with purposeful technology can truly make an impact on the world. So this afternoon, we're going to talk to you about how we do just that. By unlocking the power of scientific biomedical data and enabling scientists, engineers, and researchers to come up with new discoveries that human beings would not be able to come up with on their own. But before we begin, I want to get serious for a second. I want to talk to you and put this all into context. How many of you receive requests like this, asking you to help raise funds for a loved one that is suffering from a devastating disease? I'm sure that almost all of you do. Disease doesn't discriminate. It impacts us all. And although there are millions of campaigns like these, all too often, far too many people lose their lives. Their lives are being cut short. For those who have lived through the agonizing experience of someone that they love being diagnosed with a devastating disease, you, know, you suddenly become this amateur cl clinician. The impact of it really hits home. You start studying everything you can find about that disease. You look at um, clinical trials, surgical methods, treatment protocols, pain management. You engage with anyone who has a point of view that might give you some insight into one nugget that might change the prognosis or help the person that you loved. But all too often, there's no help to be found. Now, you might be thinking, in a world where so much has been reimagined by technology, how is it that we still have so many diseases that have no treatments, and so many families and so many loved ones suffering from rare and devastating diseases? It's an enormous challenge. Now, according to one of the disease ontologies we use to understand the number of diseases out there, there's 23,538 diseases that have been identified in the world. Now, according to the US Food and Drug Administration, only 3% of those diseases have treatments currently. Now, I think that you must, you must gasp when you hear such a statistic, because it's absolutely astonishing that for all those diseases, only 3% have a treatment. So there's that many families that have no hope. Now, in spite of the tens of billions that's being spent today on research and development, there's still thousands of diseases without any treatment at all. And there's over 300 million people living er every day with rare diseases that unless we disrupt the economic model of the way diseases or drugs are developed, and unless we develop new treatments using technology, there won't be a treatment developed for those 300 million people anytime soon. But let's talk about the, you know, the size and the scale of this problem. You know, it costs $2.5 billion to come up with a new drug today, and it takes 10 to 15 years. Furthermore, the top 10 selling drugs in the market the ones that you hear about on television every day when you're watching TV, those drugs work for 30 to 50% of the patients they're prescribed for. Imagine any other industry where, you know, if 70% of the people that were using a product had that product fail. I mean, it's just incredible that we're failing patients on such a massive level. Now, you might be wondering, why is it that there's so few treatments for disease and why this problem is so challenging? Well, first of all, biology is incredibly complex. The human body is a product of millions of years of evolution. We, our own bodies are, you know, you know decades and, 
you know, thousands and millennia of years um, in terms of mutations and permutations that make each and every one of us a unique individual. If you combine that with the 37 trillion cells that are in the human body, it makes us the most complex data system ever created. Now, although you and I might be diagnosed with the same disease, because it's, we have the same symptoms or our disease is located in the same part of the body, realistically, we have very different diseases, and that's why it's so hard to fight disease. The underlying molecular mechanisms, the pathways, the biological processes that are unique to every one of us make it really difficult to understand and diagnose that disease and develop a treatment for it. Another factor is that we as humans are only able to consume and comprehend so much information. Now today there's been this explosion of biomedical data. There's so much information out there and it's growing exponentially. But we as human beings are only able to absorb and process the same amount. There are 10,000 scientific papers published every day. Combine that with the millions of patents, chemical databases, clinical trials, and all the other relevant data that would be useful in developing and designing new treatments for patients. It's a wonder that scientists come up with anything at all. The sheer volume of research that's being produced makes it impossible for any one scientist or team of researchers to make sense and comprehend all that information. But while this vast and expanding corpus of data continues to grow, and it represents this human, human limitation, it lends itself perfectly to machine learning, and that's what we're gonna to talk to you about today. AI can help us uncover relationships between diseases and symptoms, drugs and their effect, which patients might respond to a treatment, and much more. Relationships that would not have previously been uncovered due to this overwhelming volume of biomedical information and its inherent complexity. Our mission at Benevolent is to unlock the potential of scientific data, turning it from information that overwhelms us into knowledge that can inspire us. We have a world-class team of over 200 biologists, chemists, data scientists, working every day to harness the power of AI and to unlock new insights that might help them disrupt the way we design and develop medicines for patients so that no disease goes untreated. It's a journey that starts with formulating a hypothesis that predicts the underlying cause of a disease and through many rounds of experimentation and testing, we validate that hypothesis. Then we turn to chemistry. We turn to designing, synthesizing, and developing that model, that molecule using AI. And this is, presents a radically different approach. And the last thing that we do is we look at the right patients that will respond to that drug, and we design a clinical trial that's meant to support them and to ensure that they get the maximum therapeutic benefit. Now this is a process that we call a disease sprint, and we're gonna show you how we explore a uh, disease sprint for a very um, challenging disease. It's one of the most devastating diseases in the world, and it's called glioblastoma. Now glioblastoma, as you may be familiar, um, takes, has taken the lives of some people that you know, like Senator John McCain, um, Bo Biden, and my, my friend, my noble friend, um, UK Cabinet Minister Tessa Zhao. After a vibrant career that spanned over 40 years in public service, Tessa lost her fight to an aggressive form of brain cancer called glioblastoma multiforme. I want to share with you a clip of her last speech in the House of Lords. Just briefly, Just briefly. what happened to me? I got into a taxi, but I couldn't speak. I had two powerful seizures. I was taken to hospital. Two days later, I was told that I had a brain tumor. Less than 2% of cancer research funding is spent on brain tumors. And no new vital drugs have been developed in the last 50 years. Glioblastoma, or GBM as it's called, is a savage disease. 
It's the most common of all brain tumors. According to the U.S. National Cancer Institute, 23,000 new cases were diagnosed here in the United States alone in 2018. And we lost 16,000 patients to the disease. Without treatment, a patient normally dies within three months. With an aggressive combination and a brutal protocol, including chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, some patients survive around a year, which is how long Tessa survived before she lost her fight. Today, I want to give you a look into a behind-the-scenes way in which we look at this disease. We try to look at radical new ways of understanding this disease um, across all kinds of domains, all uh, scientific domains, bringing all those experts together in a disease sprint that we're currently running for glioblastoma. To help me do that, I'd like to invite three of my colleagues to the stage, Jamie, Fujita, and Ollie. Hi, uh, I'm Jamie. I'm a senior product manager at Benevolent. So what I do is I bring the science and the technology together and build the platforms that we use to do things like disease prints and uncover better treatments for this disease. Hopefully, I'm going to show you what that looks like in action today. Hi, I'm Pujita. I'm a drug discovery scientist. And today, I'm going to talk to you about how we are applying our machine learning models to find new medicines for the discovery programs we have. And hi, I'm Ollie. I'm a machine learning engineer at Benevolent. I help to create the algorithms that read up these papers from the millions of articles Joanna was talking about. And I'm going to talk and interrupt a little bit about the, about the technology we use as we go on. <laughs> so, Petita, you've been studying cancer for over a decade, um, specifically glioblastoma. Can you tell us a little bit more about the disease? Right. So, glioblastoma, as you said, is the brain tumor with the highest severity. It usually starts with persistent headaches, nausea and like uh, memory loss and onset of seizures. So what happens is that it usually starts in one part of the brain, uh, but the tumor infiltrates the neighboring tissues and spreads really rapidly. Although it's, uh, like we saw, it's quite common in older patients, it doesn't discriminate the age. So young patients also get GBM. And uh, yeah, so uh, scientifically, how GBM occurs and why GBM, like why do patients get glioblastoma is very poorly understood. And uh, yeah, so treatment wise, what we have is, like you said, surgery is the best treatment. So we remove the tumor with the surgery and followed by chemo and radiation therapy. Uh, but most of the GBMs usually recur. So patients get the tumors back again in time. So I, you have to wonder why despite so many years of research, there's still no effective treatment protocol for yeah. GBM. And it's because it's such a heterogeneous disease and it's so complicated. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, actually, yeah, I think it's important for us to stop and think why it's hard to find, I mean, why is it untreatable still, yeah. right? So let's think of it in three main points. Like the first one, GBM is quite complex and diverse. No two patients are similar. The genetic makeup is completely different and the cancer is evolving and adapting over time. So to find a one drug that's going to work for the patient all the time is next to impossible. So that's one of the first things. And second, the tumor is in the brain, right? So you need to make drugs that are able to penetrate your brain. And we're all, we all have something called as the blood-brain barrier, which the essential function of that is to avoid harmful toxins from entering our brain. So making drugs that actually penetrate your brain is extremely challenging, and that's why many drugs fail in the clinical trials. Yeah, so what you're saying is that the reason it's so difficult to come up with a treatment for glioblastoma is there's so many factors. First and foremost is the glioblastoma stem cells are hard to treat because of this blood-brain barrier challenge. It's hard to develop a medicine that will penetrate that. Yeah, yeah, so it's good that you bring up that. So, uh, yeah, the third one was the glioblastoma stem cells, right? So you have a tumor, you do the surgery, and you treat them, uh, you give chemotherapy and radiation therapy. This removes most of the tumor, but you're still left with some cells in your brain, right? So the worst of them is the glioblastoma stem cells. Why they're so bad is because these stem cells are extremely hard to target. They're buried within your tumor, so it's really challenging to remove them all. And these glioblastoma stem cells have the capacity to actually recreate the whole tumor from scratch over time. So leaving even one behind is quite lethal. 
So with all the information that's published on glioblastoma, I think there's something like 800 clinical trials going on at the moment. Um, how do you, as a researcher, um, you know, try to make sense of all that information in a traditional environment? Right. So before my life in Benevolent, I was uh, doing my uh, medical research. So typically what we do is when we have a disease, we spend about like two to three months trying to read up about the disease, reading the, I mean, reading the literature and all the reviews that's out there. And probably the best I could manage is maybe like 20 to 30 papers and uh, on the disease. But you continuously have to read and keep yourself up to date with everything that's published. And like we said, there are about 10,000 papers that's being published every day, so it's almost impossible to read all of them and keep them in your mind and actually be able to make inferences on top of it. So yeah, that's quite challenging. So when you're thinking, um, when you're researching a heterogeneous disease like that, you know, the complexity of the terrain, you know, the amount of information that's being published, all those things make it really challenging for researchers and scientists to come up with, um, you know, to formulate new hypotheses and come up with new ways to treat that disease. So I'd like to turn this over next to Jamie, who will talk about how we, you know, th the benevolent platform makes sense of all that scientific data and helps scientists come up with more refined hypotheses that will help us actually treat the disease. So, I mean, that's exactly what the genesis of Benevolent was like. We wanted to have this audacious goal to build what we consider to be the world's largest biomedical uh, knowledge base. And the idea is we could apply this then to find those treatments for the diseases like GBM. So, what I want to show you was um, this knowledge base contains everything that we consider to be important in terms of that research. So, we talked a lot about that information, right? Diseases, genes. In fact, I think there's 22 different types of entity in this knowledge base that we have. Um, and over one billion relationships between these, uh, um, these relationships between these entities. And I think the important piece here is the context and how we pull that all together. So what we did was, uh, well, what I've been doing in the company for the last three years is build a platform on top of that to answer two fundamental questions. One of those is give me everything I need to know about a disease like GBM in a way that's more than 20 to 30 papers, but literally everything that I care about, and show it in a way that's meaningful, because that's the starting point. And the second part of the platform, which we'll show a little bit later, kind of as part of the disease sprint, is identify the gaps between the information, because that's where we think the answers are uh, around that information. So I'm going to try and show you uh, live what the system looks like, uh, at least for the first part of that question. So I've got my handy laptop here. Hopefully the hamsters are rolling. Let's see what it looks. So, yeah, you can see it on there. Okay, so the idea is if you take um, the task that Pajita had in mind, right, thinking of all this information, what we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to build plus of the, uh, parts of the platform that allowed us to give that snapshot of, of research around glioblastoma. So I can do this and I can type in something like glioblastoma. But bear in mind that I could do this for any of the diseases that we have in our knowledge graph, because what we want to do is be disease agnostic and do this for multiple different times with different types of diseases. You can see I can click on this button, and what it will do is it will give me all of the context and all the information around glioblastoma. And it starts off very simple, because this is going to be used by a scientist. So you see here you've got a number of, uh, a number of connections that are in our knowledge graph. Joanna talked about these clinical trials. You can see these, these are ongoing uh, and um, completed clinical trials around the particular disease. Things are important, like understanding what chemistry we've already tested against the disease. Even the underlying biology about that disease is fundamentally important. Yeah, and it's, I think we really should take a moment to know that for someone like me who comes from a very biological research background, getting this information was super valuable. Like, it, it looks at everything, the clinical trials, the chemistry and everything. So you don't need to be an expert to know all of these. So going in, I get all the information that I require for any disease that I'm looking at. So in this instance, glioblastoma is one of the examples we are showing. So. Yeah. And I think it's important to, to illustrate that the information comes from very different uh, yeah. data sources, right? So the idea here is we want to have that unbiased view. Yeah. So some of it comes from curated, proprietary, and public data sources where we extracted that information. But a significant portion comes from those papers, the unstructured data that we care about. Yeah, so that unstructured data are these scientific articles that Pajita was talking about earlier. So the language in those articles is quite different to, to how it would be in a newspaper or elsewhere. It's quite complex, and we use natural language processing algorithms, machine learning algorithms that can recognize concepts and information that we care about. We're not really reading those articles per se. I don't want to overhype uh, AI uh, too much. Um, but they, what they do is they recognize the kinds of 
language that scientists use to describe important information, and they're transforming it inf into information that can be read by other machines. And I'm going to show you a little bit what that looks like later. For now, it's enough to say that about a third of all the relationships in our database have come only from the literature, so they couldn't have come from anywhere else. Yeah, and that's incredibly important. As a starting point, though, what we want to do is obviously, this is just a bunch of numbers at this stage. We want to give a snapshot of that information. So I can click on the name here, glioblastoma. And what that does is it takes us to what is an overview page for uh, GBM. And the idea was we designed these overview pages in order for us to understand that entire sort of view of glioblastoma. And these pages, uh, and what's something that we are quite passionate and benevolent about, is built with scientists and technologists hand in hand. So as we build these, we get the feedback from the, from the drug discoverers, the researchers, as well as making sure that it's concise information. So things like understanding recent reviews that we care about in terms of the disease, the associated drugs that we know are existing, the symptoms, and even the aggregated information around the clinical trials uh, is very important for us. And as we mentioned before, this means that it comes from a lot of different data sources, so it's trying to be unbiased. If we, if we pause here for a second, I want to kind of uh, touch on a point, uh, looking at something like uh, clinical trials. There's 800 ongoing clinical trials. A large majority of them are in this phase two. So phase two, probably around seven to 10 years of research has gone up to the stage in tens of millions of dollars, right? That is a long time and a lot of information, but we're still at a stage where we don't quite have an effective treatment. So there's something fundamental that we need to change about this process. But more importantly, we know that within this body of research, there's something um, that is going to be the idea that's going to take us forward that we can actually start to optimize for. So if I go back to this first screen again, what I want to do is to, to illustrate some of these ideas that we care about. So we talk about having 5,000 targets associated to GBM. Yeah, just so to clarify what a target means, it's basically a gene or a protein that we're looking for, right? So in instance, for glioblastoma stem cells, we need to find those targets. It's basically like turning a gene on and off. So we want to find drugs that are able to do that and target the glioblastoma stem cells, just yeah. the clarification. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And, and as a cancer researcher, you probably know um, some of these targets well because that's your area of research, so for example, yeah. glioblastoma stem cells, but there's others that you won't know about that it's presenting to you. And the important thing that we realize is the interconnectedness between all this information, the interconnectedness between these different groups is fundamental to be able to understand um, basically the mechanisms within the disease. But it's a lot of information, right? 5,000 targets, just to put that into perspective, there's 20,000 known genes in the human genome. So to say that a quarter of the entire genome is a potential target for a cure, it's just not practical, it's impossible. So what we want to do is we want to be able to understand, actually, can we start to use this information to focus that? So what I've got here, and what we've got as another um, part of the platform, is a network view. So I'm just going to uh, quickly let this lay out uh, and then start to show as it expands. And what you're looking at here is essentially we've taken those targets for GBM, these genes and these proteins, and we've laid it out as a network. So you're looking at what we consider to be the glioblastoma network for the disease. And why this is important, if I just stop it here, is each one of these dots, each one of these nodes represents one of those gene proteins, those targets. And the information, uh, these edges, is connections between them that we know to be true today about the disease. And what you can see is that there's shaded areas, so clusters of these genes that we care about, that may be specific, for example, to glioblastoma. Right. So these may be the targets I care about. But what you don't see from other views and why this is quite uh, powerful is I can start to see that how do these orange nodes, which may represent one of the things I care about, connect with the other sides of the disease? Because it's probably between those two that we care about to find those answers. So really what this is, is the starting point to understand glioblastoma its entirety, and then from that information, we can start to ask questions to focus in specifically on some of those pieces, and then really take that onto the next part of the platform, which we're gonna talk about now. Which yeah. is really at the heart of the disease sprint and the target identification process, which is what we're currently running in between our Cambridge, London, and New York offices. This way. So if we can take the slide on one more. So the disease sprint while we're doing this involves a cross-functional team of 26 machine learning researchers, drug discoverers, and software developers, product managers, and data scientists all working in you know, cross-functional squads using different data, different models, different theories to interrogate that data and tailor the machine learning models to, um, to understand and reason across all that data and to uncover new insights that we can use to developing these new treatments. 
So we all know that somewhere in this vast, you know, corpus of biological data, that there's a new way of looking at glioblastoma and how do we attack those stem cells? How do we stop them from replicating and creating new tumors? And that is the process that we're undergoing in this disease sprint. This process is so important because, you know, these five different research teams are all working on different models and interrogating that data in unique ways. And now we're going to show you how that, I guess behind me, we're showing you how that actually works in practice. Okay. Yeah, so we have been talking about, like, glioblastoma, right? So, but that's a big challenge to take. We wanted to focus on something that's really important. And like we explained, glioblastoma stem cells are the root of the cancer. So we wanted to focus on finding targets that would impact the glioblastoma stem cells. And that's what we focused during the disease sprint. And, uh, yeah, so that was our main focus. And then I guess I, I'm going to ask Ollie how we um, make sense of all this ingested data and contextualize it and so that we can really identify the genes that are involved in the stem cell um, recreation of that tumor and how do we stop that using the, the molecule that we're designing that modulates that target. Sure. Um, so yeah, during this disease sprint, uh, our teams worked on five different ways in parallel of doing exactly that, of trying to find novel ways of attacking these stem cells at the heart of these tumors. Um, and we're going to show just a couple of them now uh, on this complicated layer that we drew earlier. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll show two sort of complementary ways that we use to, to come up with new treatments. You don't need to worry about all the details on this thing. It is a complicated thing. Um, so, Jamie was showing you earlier uh, a tool that was sitting on top of our graph, this knowledge base of millions of entities and billions of relationships that connect all of biology together. And so he was talking about how a scientist can use this tool, and I'll t tell you for a little bit uh, what our machines can do. So they also work on top of this and come up with sort of insights and things for us. And they also created large parts of it themselves, and they created it using natural language processing algorithms in order to read the scientific literature. So I'll just show you a small example of what that actually looks like. So, so here's a sentence uh, that comes from a paper from a couple of years ago. It's talking about these stem cells and this uh, archi 8 scoot homolog one gene, and is expressing that there is a relationship between these two things. This gene is more active uh, in these stem cells, uh, as discovered by these scientists. Um, you can draw your own conclusions as to whether this is an easy sentence for you to digest or not. Uh, I think uh, Pajita would say this is quite a straightforward statement in the literature. Um, but one of the interesting things about the scientific literature is that scientists actually have to be quite careful about what they say. Uh, they don't want to say things that don't have evidence. Uh, and so, what they end up with is all kinds of language that's actually quite different to how you would see it uh, if you were uh, reading in, in web pages or Wikipedia or other places like that. And so what we've done is we've trained our natural language algorithms using millions of sentences, and we've linked them to things that are known. And that way, we're exposing our algorithms to all the different way that scientists in particular are expressing these relations. And so what we have on the right here is what our, our algorithms have extracted, they've noticed that we've got this cell and this gene and there's this relationship between them. There's all kinds of different relationships that there can be between them. And so if you imagine if we did it on not just one sentence or a million sentence or a billion sentences, that you'll start to build up a whole graph, a sort of connected uh, set of nodes and edges that make uh, a beautiful sort of combination that shows uh, what biology looks like. Uh, well. It's not, it's not that beautiful, really. I, it, yeah, it looks, actually, to me, it looks like a little bit of a mess, doesn't it? Well, biology is a mess, so I wouldn't be surprised that it is like that. Yeah. Well, that's uh, reassuring, I, I, I hope. Um, and yet, the graph is incomplete, because if actually we had a cure for glioblastoma, it would be somewhere on here already, and it's not. So we need something on top of this to be able to complete this graph. We want to be able to use it to generate new ideas. And so we have another family of machine learning algorithms that are doing this uh, link prediction. So what we want to do is train AI algorithms that can identify what's logical, uh, but what's not already been explicitly stated. It's an active area of machine learning research, and there's all kinds of sophisticated models that you'll be relieved I won't be going into too, too much detail. Um, we have got one model that we use for this. It's called uh, Optimus Prime. 
know, we're, uh, we're big fans of Transformers, and clearly Optimus Prime is the best Transformer, hands down. <laughs> That's maybe not true, but we don't need no, to worry about true. that. It's true. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to go into any details, but what, what Optimus Prime does is it learns the representation of the structure of this whole graph. In general, how do entities of a particular kind, say a cell or a stem cell, relate to other entities such as a gene? Um, and once this has been trained, we can then deploy it on the things that we care about. We can plug in genes that we know that we can uh, create drugs for. Uh, we can plug in genes that are related to these stem cells, and we get a prediction score for each one of them. Yeah. So that's quite cool. And yet, it's not, e it's not actually enough for our very demanding scientists all the time. That's actually quite true, actually. We, we do have a lot of requests for our machine learning and technology guys all the time. But, but honestly, you, you have such a massive graph, right? So I'm thinking as a scientist, you have so much information. How do I find the right targets for glioblastoma stem cells? How do I, I mean, how does the model actually traverse from going from a node, which is GBM, to actually finding the right target that is glioblastoma stem cells? So we as scientists need to know how you make that inference of a target to be able to confidently say that this is actually a right interpretation. So that was my request, and I think that's logical, so. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you've probably heard about the six degrees of separation, that, that theory by which any two of us, me and any of you, are somehow related by six or so acquaintance uh, links, perhaps involving Kevin Bacon, because for some reason he's connected to everyone, mostly A-listers, not myself, I have to say. Um, and what we find is that there's actually quite a few Kevin Bacon genes and things in biology as well. You've got various areas that are just connected with everything. And so paths that go through those, sort of, those big uh, hubs uh, would be immediately suspicious to a scientist yeah. such as uh, Pajita. And so we introduced a further model that makes predictions by doing exactly this, sort of hopping around the graph, going from something that we know to something that we don't know. Um, and so this model gets rewarded when it does things well and it gets punished when it doesn't do things so well. Um, and we know whether it did well or not because we use our original Optimus Prime model to, uh, to say whether it was a, a good idea or not. So in some ways, we have one AI model teaching another one, which is kind of cool. What so it also what does... Looking, like, can you explain a bit? Because as a scientist, I want to like, think that the path that the model takes in the figure below, like there, you want to go through the golden path, right, where it's connected to GBM and GSE and then arrives at the target. Is that what you mean by rewarding the right path? Yes, so, so there are some paths that you want, to, you want to go through, and there's some other paths which are not leading you anywhere very interesting. Right. And so we have a, a so-called reinforcement learning model, which is, is continually being rewarded or punished, but depending on, on, on whether it's uh, doing well. Um, what it does do is it it gets away from the sort of black box issue with AI, where you just have a prediction and a score and go, ta-da, there's your score. Uh, and then the scientist is unsure what to do with it. So here, we have a model that is both showing you a prediction, but it's also showing some of its working that allows the scientist to be able to make uh, a genuine judgment as to whether, whether to go forward with it. So this is just one of those workflows that we talked about. It's a literature-based discovery. Um, and so while we're looking at that, it's not the only way that you would choose to treat glioblastoma. Um, if you actually want to look at a complicated disease like this, it would be crazy not to uh, look at the patient data that we have for that disease and, and do other things. So while my team was working in the disease sprint on, on this area, um, another team was working on exactly that, of using patient data. Yeah, so I work with the precision medicine team within our company, and uh, like Oli said, like not just looking at literature, we need to look at the data that's generated from the patients, right? So patient data like electronic health records and genetic sequences from the patients themselves. So we are developing new models that will infer from these patient data that's being generated. There's a huge amount of biomedical data that's being generated now, which is quite rich and it's quite amazing, but it's also complex. And to identify patterns from this data is really challenging. But that's, that's the beauty of it now with the machine. It's like a perfect problem for a machine learning model, right? So you, you give it a lot of data and you ask it to infer from the patient data as well. So, so that's exactly what we are doing in the precision medicine team. Like how do we find patterns within these patients? And how can we go and find those subgroup of patients which have like a similar mechanism underlying them? And uh, can we develop drugs for those subset of patients? So we know that the drug is going to work for them. Yeah. 
I mean, I think it's, it's worth uh, reiterating yeah. that what we're doing here is not um, trying to replace a scientist with a machine learning algorithm. They're not going to push a button and it's going to be able to solve precision medicine. It's augmenting that with finding yeah. the signatures that maybe with all those vast amounts of data, you wouldn't be able to do without that help, right? It's trying to give you that superhuman power to give you a signature in the data that you may want to do uh, right. that will help find the differentiation between the two right. uh, different um, patient right. groups, right? Right, yeah, it's exactly those kind of patterns that we're looking in the precision medicine. So like, like I just said that you have all these patients, so what is that exact signature, which kind of, you can think of it as a signature is something that's referring to a biological mechanism that's shared between them. And the model will be able to infer on those patient data that you give it, what are those patterns and how do we, is there any targets that we can find that glioblastoma stem cell yeah. relevant that's gonna work for these patients who are more likely to have that mechanism. So we not just tell like, you develop a drug, but we also can infer like which patients is it probably going to work in. So that's the kind of information we are looking at from the patient data. So this actually presents a fundamental shift in the way you know, drug research and development happens today. So first of all, the models help you infer from what you do know what you don't know. So they actually give you new insights and help you identify you know, which patients will be impacted by those insights. Absolutely. And this also means that um, we, we can bring the patients into a clinical trial that are most likely to benefit from that, you know, from that medication. And therefore, we can shorten the time it takes for a trial to happen, we can reduce the cost, and we can make sure that that medicine is efficacious yeah. for those patient groups. Yeah, absolutely, we need to keep the patient in the center absolutely. of every research we are doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, going back to our lovely diagram here. Um, <laughs> so, we've talked about two of the workflows that we've uh, deployed. Um, and in each case, there's some area uh, of machine learning, and there's an area of the, sci the scientist being fully involved in the progress. Um, what we want to do is we want to aggregate all these approaches together at the end. Uh, we want to, to be scientists, and we want to come up with the approaches uh, that are backed with multiple sources of independent evidence that would lead us to something that looks like a great candidate. Yeah, because I think what we found during this process was being naturally highly competitive individuals was we all want to support our own flows, right? Brigitte wants the uh, patient stratification one to work, and Ali wants the multi hop to work. So we thought scientifically the best way for us to get around that was to uh, build what we call a leaderboard. And the idea was could you take all of your models and apply that to some gold standard benchmark that you could measure against for something like glioblastoma stem cells? Um, and then uh, could we measure how good our models do? Well, we actually found that uh, the best models were the ones that were aggregated together, um, and they performed the best uh, around those. So we took the targets from the models that were aggregated together, uh, and that's what we actually triaged as part of the next step. Yeah, so our, our scientists will sit down, and they, they can go through all of these lists, and they, I don't know, they can sort of swipe left when they look at a gene that they don't really <laughs> like the look of. He's not even joking, they literally can swipe left. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any Tinder users in the house? <laughs> no? Yeah, we, we did actually build uh, a tool called Chemda, uh, which is like a Tinder for chemicals where scientists would go in and they, they would just look at a picture of a molecule and actually some, some chemists can look at a molecule and say, no, that's not a drug, and they, just, they would just swipe it left. I'd like to say as a product manager, I had nothing to do with that design at all. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah. So nowadays we we have a tool uh, where scientists can make make more sort of refined judgments yeah, as, as exactly. to uh, what we're going to spend millions of dollars on, um, uh, with all the kind of metadata they need in order to make fair and unbiased choices. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like just getting a target. We do get a lot of information of why the target was inferred. So like expression, a lot of things, and that gives an informed choice. It's, in the end, we do swipe left or right, but we do have information to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just to, as we conclude this process, so once we have a list of ranked targets produced from the disease sprint, we validate these experimentally in our labs in Cambridge. We have a research facility there with over 35 um, now uh, wet, wet, lab, wet lab scientists. Mm -hmm. Um, so what you see in this video is really the process of them sort of going through this experimental phase. Um, but this month, now in our Cambridge Research Facility, we started testing the glioblastoma stem cells in a disease-relevant assay with patient-derived cells. So we do real science at Benevolent, and we're working in collaboration with leading research institutes 
to make sure that these experiments are as realistic as possible and that they inform the next stage of the development of these hypotheses so that we can get to designing and developing a molecule for the right patient group and to get these out of the lab and into uh, clinical trials. So, um, so the, the next thing that we need to do is we need to design the right drug to hit that target. So we talked about chemical structures and, and swiping left and right, but realistically we need to bring together all of those factors that make a good, a good molecule so that we can address the challenge of penetrating the stem cells, um, penetrating the blood-brain barrier and ensuring that we can treat those stem cells so they don't replicate and create new tumors. Now, to achieve this, we've developed another AI technology that we call EvoChem that basically um, it uses multi-parametric optimization to design and synthesize the right molecule to hit that target so that we can um, modulate it and we can have the potential to influence those cells. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that platform is what we call EvoChem, and I've got a video of it this time, not a live uh, demonstration in the background. What you can see there is, if you think about the chemical space, it is actually quite complicated. There's something like 10 to the power of 60 potential chemical structures that one could make to make a good drug. That's a massive amount. So what we did is we trained AI to understand what good chemical structures look like and how they can predict what it looks like to get through the body. And for some of those parameters, for example, blood-brain barrier penetrance. What we found was with the EvoChem um, uh, platform, what we asked was chemists can go in, they can uh, ask for what features they want to have a good drug look like, and one of these would be blood-brain barrier yeah. penetrance, for example, but there's a whole bunch of other factors that are all interplaying. And the system will go away, will look at this chemical structure, and it will provide a number of novel structures you may not have seen as a chemist before, because it's in spaces your research is never taken into, so it's kind of taking that bias away again. What we found was we didn't just take these um, chemical structures forward by themselves that the AI produced. We found the perfect examples were where the system, like, produced chemicals like this, the chemist could come into the system, actually interact with them, design, uh, or modify, and adapt them to tweak them a little bit, kind of using the AI as an inspiration engine. And that was quite powerful because those were the ones we found to be the most effective. What we saw as a result uh, and a net result of this in some of our programs is you can design far fewer chemicals uh, in a much quicker space of time because you're augmenting this with massive help from the AI, but you also synthesize far fewer in the lab because you have less cycles of these that you have to take forward. And that's incredible because that data we can also learn from and further power the systems. Yeah. So today we've um, taken you through the entire platform end to end from data ingestion all the way to where we have a preclinical candidate. So we've um, identified how we, uh, how we find the right target, and how we design and develop the molecule to hit that target, and then how do we define the patient population that is most likely to receive a therapeutic benefit from that drug. And that's the process end to end. Yeah, so, so like I mentioned in the precision medicine team, we are learning from the patient data, not just to identify new targets that would work for the patient subgroup, but also take this one step forward and be able to design better clinical trials for those patients. So, so the machine learning models that we are develop, developing, so we identify both clinical and molecular mechanisms that could underlie similar patients, right? So, and we, we can then identify patients, subgroups that are more likely to respond to the drug we are developing, and then design our clinical trial arms much better so you can balance for the responders versus those who, who might not respond. So this increases the chance of your drug uh, having a success at the clinical trial, right? So in a clinical trial, you have to statistically show that your drug works in comparison to a placebo or a standard of care that's out there. So uh, to actually enhance that statistical significance, if we were to find the right subgroups that respond to our drug, that does increase the power of the clinical trial to achieve like more success than normal clinical trial would. So there is something we could do with the machine learning models and impact the trial design here, and that's exactly what we are doing, to use the data, yeah. find those responders, find those patients, and design trials for them. So, yeah. Exactly. yeah. So just in conclusion, like this approach will help us um, find the right um, precise treatment for patients and design a clinical trial that will ensure um, greater success in that trial and more effective medicines for the millions of patients that need them. So just to wrap up here, and then we'll take some questions. Um, at Benevolent, we have this message that glows in neon in our lobby. It says, because it matters. 
It inspires and unites us in a shared purpose, and it defines and guides everything that we do. Drug development takes years, and every day that we are improving our platform, we have a higher chance of achieving success and finding new treatments for diseases. But the power of our platform is actually extends way beyond one disease, like what we've talked about today. It really allows us to iterate and to experiment across many diseases and do this at a previously unimaginable scale and speed. So we're currently in our labs progressing 15 programs. Um, and we have this in our clinical pipeline. And we're focused on where we believe our machine learning algorithms and our benevolent knowledge graph will have the biggest impact. So we're focused on 15 diseases across various mechanisms. And we're working to develop treatments for the millions of patients that need them. Now, but we recognize that no one business um, can have this kind of an impact on a sector like drug discovery and development all on our own. So that we plan to open up our platform and really challenge the status quo of the way drugs are discovered and developed. Opening our platform to world leading researchers, academics, um, medical charities, and um, partners in industry who can help leverage our platform and to make the most of the research and development that we've created. Now, just in conclusion, there's a sense of urgency and conviction to everything that we do. I mean, you saw at the very beginning, you know, the millions of GoFundMe pages and the fact that only 3% of the diseases that have been identified of the some 20, 23,000 diseases have a treatment. So what we do, we do it to disrupt the way drugs are discovered and developed. We do it to deliver new and more effective treatments for patients. And we do it because it matters. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> now, I think we're using Slido. I think some of you guys have been presented with or given, um, add to Slido some questions that might be of interest to you. And hopefully, we'll be able to answer some of those for you today. Yeah, let's see. Questions. Okay, so there's a couple of options here. So the first one is, what changes to drug d development after the, the target identification are needed? And how well does benevolent fit into existing systems and processes? Yeah. Did you want to try That's that? One, yeah. uh, I could start. Yeah. That's from Ken, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ken. <laughs> Might be our founder in Cognito out there. His name is Ken. <laughs> Yeah, so what changes uh, to drug development after target identification? Yeah, so we have identified the target, right? So after that, uh, we do refine our targets. We test them in the experimental models and uh, whatever results we get. So you have identified the best targets, right? You need to see whether it works experimentally or not. And what we do is from the results that we get out of the experiments, uh, we actually feed it back into the models, like some of the targets that the model predicted to work might not have worked in the experimental setup. So basically, it learns to re, like kind of re-predict again the best target. So it's kind of an active learning process. So we feed in the experimental data that we generate back into the model. So this usually doesn't take so much time. The only limitation we have found is basically the amount of time it takes to run the experiments. As soon as that's run, it takes about a week to come up with new targets. So it's an iterative process because we want to really find the, the best target, right? So we don't want to find like 10 different targets that are pretty good to progress. We need to find that one target mm -hmm. for which there's one good drug that can be taken forward. So yeah, that's yeah. I mean, that. I can, I can add to that from sort of a, a, a high level. That is, once you have the right drug target, that's just one piece, right? We, we've talked about this idea that right drug target, right drug, and then right patient. The next steps of that process, and the EvoChem is one example in the precision medicine pieces is, there's many factors that make a good drug that needs to get in the body more than just its efficaciousness or how good it is at hitting that particular target. So the chemistry piece, what we call traditionally lead optimization, is where AI can have an impact as well, and that's what we do. And the third part is that precision medicine piece. What we're trying to do, as, as Joanne and Brigitte talked about, is you bring the clinic and the, the, the uh, signatures of those patients up front to target identification. And kind of just generally speaking, what it means for us is that 
there is siloing that typically happens across this process traditionally when you have a bunch of biologists who will go be really good at understanding a good target, but that information doesn't get transferred to the chemists who will build a good drug. They just say, here's the target, go and find me some chemistry. What we're trying to do and what we've built is this platform and the knowledge graph and the knowledge base behind it that means that transfer of knowledge can happen across the board because that's fundamentally the important pieces, right? It's not just going to be a good drug target information that's needed around biology. You're going to need things around chemistry that's important there. So. I would say from, a, from a, a position, benevolent is trying to do that, getting all that data across. And I think just the second part of the question was how well do we fit into existing systems? The, our process of drug discovery is very similar to what you would have in the context. It, it follows the same route, target ID, then lead optimization, then uh, clinical trial or clinician. But what we have is the ability to plug and play data from partners that we want, uh, that we need, because we've built this massive, massive knowledge base. And what we've, what we've learned is we can get access to patient level data that's uh, anonymized. Yeah. We can get access to uh, curated protein protein interaction data, to chemistry data. So it is very, very compatible with existing systems in that context. And the process itself is not too dissimilar, it's just disruptive in the way we apply it. Gonna have Ollie's gonna take the next question. Okay, so there's one about has patient data shown results different to the scientific literature, and how do you reconcile this difference? Um, it's kind of inevitable that the scientific literature will, will be different in general to when, when you have a patient data which is talking about specific uh, individuals. There's also the cases when uh, the scientific literature is talking about different contexts, and those can also be. Uh, mistakes in the scientific literature. There can be things that have been published 20 or 30 years ago that have changed since they are now. Um, and so there's all kinds of different ways in which this doesn't match up because, as, as we saw, the biology is really complicated. Um, and so what we try to do is we try to aggregate these approaches together um, and there will always be a scientist in the end who will look uh, at these, these different the evidences that have come out in order to understand whether this is something that's worth to carry on with. Yeah, actually I'd like to add to that. One value we found with the patient data was that you get the information about the patient subgroups, right? So the literature doesn't make the distinction of like how diverse the data is, like how likely it is. So we found like with the aggregation model that when we aggregate it, we can actually use the patient data, whatever targets the literature-based model would have found to actually see in which patient subgroups does it fit. So it's like really complementary rather than very different, and that's exactly the reason why, like Jamie was saying during the talk, was that the aggregation model worked the best rather than each model in itself. So yeah, so great question though. Yeah, we did find that happen. You also are illustrating why it's so important that, you know, um, Traditional, you know, um, pharma, you know, drug discovery and development is really about, you know, having your own data sets, and that becomes the IP that, you know, companies use and they protect it. I mean, the reality is that we need more open approach to drug discovery and development. If we, you know, opening up and liberating all these data sources, obviously anonymously and protecting patients' mm -hmm. um, private information, but if we don't open up these data sources, if we don't traverse the entire available you know, knowledge base around a particular disease, we reduce the opportunity to find treatments, which is why we really believe that opening up our platform, and you know, we've built an amazing resource, you know, the world's largest biomedical knowledge graph, we believe, and you know, we want to open up and allow other organizations, certainly academics and charities and researchers, to get the benefit of that data and hopefully find new insights that have up until now eluded scientists because just there's just so much complexity right. out there. And it's also important to look at it from a cross-discipline approach. You know, we have biologists, chemists, machine learning um, researchers, um, scientists all working together in, in cross-functional squads. And we think this is um, a core way of um, coming up with scientific breakthroughs because no one person has the entire picture and it forces this radical cross-functional collaboration, which we think really leads to those moonshot moments, you know, where you actually come up with something that really transforms the thinking around a particular disease. Yeah. I think uh, I really like, I mean, I joined from PhD, and in, in Benevolent, we have quite many people from pharma industry. One thing I understood was the agility with which we work. Not like in pharma, they're big corporations, right? So to actually have that cross-functional discussions and stuff is extremely challenging. And over here, you just have to work 
like two blocks, like two steps away, and then you find a chemist, you just like talk to each other. So I think that gives the speed and enthusiasm we have, which probably is quite different at Benevolent. Yeah. The next question I'd like to um, actually have Jamie and Ollie work on is, does Benevolent's AI approach provide mechanisms of action, in a, or is it a black box? I think we talked a little bit about the importance of it not being a black box and how we need to, scientists need to understand what enabled us to get to that outcome. And I think it's really worth um, going a little more detail on that. Yeah, so mechanisms of action is an absolutely key thing. We want to understand what the processes are, because um, when you look at a gene or a protein, you need to understand the context in which uh, it's operating and how that would relate to a disease. Um, so we didn't really mention it in the, in the graph, but actually we do uh, treat mechanisms as well as separate entities through which uh, our algorithms can, can learn and that they could generate predictions on. Um, there's always a, like a, a, a balance to be drawn between how much you want the algorithm to go away and work in, in its sort of complex, uh, high-dimensional space that's completely impossible for a human really to imagine, and how much we want it to operate as though we would. Um, so we try to find ways that we can get the best out of those things, either by uh, having algorithms that are just inherently intuitive, where you can understand what's going on, or by having other things that are trying to explain the, the means by which an algorithm could have come to this conclusion. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, it's something that I'm quite passionate about and something that we work on quite actively in Benevolent. And the idea is we know that scientists uh, and even regulations are never going to accept the ability that an AI is just going to tell you these five things you're going to take for because I say so, right? That black box nature is never going to cut it. And we've done a number of different approaches, one of them being these multi-hop types of inferences to suggest the ways of working that the AI uh, does its job. But the other is, can you apply biological understanding to why that might be a meaningful pathway? And this is, say, taking a, a biological stance. So the AI may find a signature that probably has nothing necessarily to do with the mechanism of action, but it might find other signatures in other parts of the disease or other parts of how it's connected. And what we can do is apply that metadata to it so that the biologist can have that reasoning and understanding as to why it comes through. So the tool that I showed earlier, that network view, you can layer on many different things, right? That is an interactive network between genes. But what I can apply on top of that is, for example, what tissues were these suggestions that came in from? What were the pathways that were important in this piece? Are there any specific parts of the body that we know we can uh, conclude because that's important? Yeah. So there's a lot of um, introspection that happens where it's kind of augmentation that the scientist gives with the tools uh, to try and get rid of that black box. Yeah, I actually want to answer the second part of that, the proof of like that it works is actually in the assays also, right? Yeah. So as a scientist, we test them in the assays. There are limitations to it. When you talk about mechanism of action, you're speaking about like, is that mechanism actually captured by the assay you're testing in? Like when we speak about finding targets for glioblastoma stem cells, if your assay doesn't have that feature, it's, if it's not stem cells, if it's something else, it's not going to like give you the proof points whether your model worked or not. So there is a, a biological limitation also how good or how translatable is your assay. So we do have those proof points and that's where the, yeah. So that's how we test and we know whether the model works. Yeah. So that's the assay side of things. So I think we have time for one more question. The, uh, the last question at the top here is, um, how do you choose which diseases get selected for a disease sprint? I'm gonna start and then I'm gonna leave it to you guys. So first and foremost, um, our benevolent knowledge graph is disease agnostic. So we work in, in three mechanistic areas. We work in stem cell survival, neuronal protection, and we also work in inflammation. So in terms of the diseases that we pick, it could be any disease that is um, related to those three mechanisms is our first choice because we believe we've got the most amount of information you know, clinical trials, research, you know, um, literature data that would make our, um, increase the likelihood of success of that program um, in, in our benevolent portfolio. I don't know if you guys want to add anything more to that. Yeah, I, um, from, so there's, there's two angles to this question, right? There's the angle in terms of what data we have available from an AI or a tech point of view as well, and we've got, um, a number of different algorithms uh, that we call AI efficacy uh, measures, which allow us to understand, very similar to what Jonah said, 
given all the data that we have today available on diseases in inflammation, is our AI more or less uh, able to have good predictions based on benchmarks for those diseases? Because we can use that as a starting point to filter out some rare diseases have very little information, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the context around that information may be more biased, or there may be more sort of con uh, conflicts, and so we want to remove those. So there is an AI efficacy score by which we can measure how good we are, but there's obviously also um, uh, sort of clinical and biological reasons why you may want to undertake things. For example, competitive space is one thing, right? At, at some point, you may want to not uh, go into that, but also unmet clinical need, understanding around uh, sort of the actual mechanisms of the biology and how, how um, available those assays are that we can test these things in. Something may be a great target that we may predict, but if we don't have the right experiment, so the right uh, wet lab experiment to test it in, it's just not possible for us to test those because we, we need that fundamental uh, proof point. Yeah. I think we're out of time, but I'll just close by saying that we're hiring in New York, London, Cambridge, and Antwerp, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you.